to all in February 2nd, 2022. I am Jay Joseph. Class was started for the spring semester on January 18th. Last weekend, SPA welcomed back students with Winter's Fest. KNSU TV, Trinice Cannon reports. Nicholas State University welcomed its students back by hosting its annual Welcome Back Winterfest. During the fair, students were able to meet various different organizations and gain more insight on what the university has to offer. The event took place during the first calendar week of the spring 2022 semester, which was open for all students to socialize, form new connections, and have fun. Groups such as the Black Student Union, the NAACP, Alpha Psi Lambda, the Film Society, and Gamma Phi Beta were present. After enjoying the fun of Winterfest, students are officially ready to take on the spring semester. Reporting for KNSU TV, I'm Trinice Cannon. This week marks the start of Black History Month. Nichols has many events planned over the course of this month. Here are the events for this week. Yesterday, Crown hosted Envisioning a Better Future, a conversation about black health and wellness. Today, there was a black mental health and wellness table in the student union, an African-American themed cuisine by Kelly Theodore in the Galileo Dining Hall. Tomorrow, there is a Zoom meeting on designing and teaching adequate and envision courses by Don Ching Yu Ha from 2.30 to 3.30. Also, tomorrow is Songs of a People, a music or concert in Daniel Steele at noon. Thursday is a Negro Spiritual Masterclass in Daniel Steele at 5 p.m. Friday, there is a trip to River Road Museum in Donaldsonville from noon to 3 p.m. hosted by SGA. Also, Friday is a celebration of Negro Spirituals at 7 p.m. in Daniel Steele. For a more extensive list of events happening on campus for Black History Month, visit www.nichols.edu slash Black History Month. Groundhog Day is a popular North American tradition observed in the United States and Canada on February 2nd. So what did the groundhog say today? Get used to the cold. Punctuating Phil emerged My from his borrowed Wednesday to see his than a long, lustrous. That means six more weeks of winter. Every February 2nd, Americans wait for Americans wait with bated breath for the Pennsylvania's groundhog shadow. According to Phil's website, he's been predicting the season since 1887. Legends has it, if he sees his shadow, we can expect the cold temps to continue. If he doesn't, uh, early spring is on the way. The National Center for Environmental Information doesn't give Phil a passing grade for the accuracy, saying over the past 10, he's only been right 40% of the time. 2021 was the year crypto went mainstream. So what can we expect from this year? Here are three trends in Cryptoverse. Cryptoverse became mainstream last year with the ups and downs of Bitcoin and explosion of interest in NFL's T. So what can we expect this year? So far in 2022, Bitcoin value tumbled almost 50% since last, hitting a record last November at nearly $7,000. Today's customers watch, we have a closer look at three trends in Cryptoverse that experts say they're closely watching as the year unfolds. Months, uh, prices fall over 50%. The Cryptoverse is expanding in 2022. Experts say interest in digital currencies and blockchain, the technology that powers them, is exploding. This year is going to be exciting. There's going to be a lot of opportunities to get involved. Here are three trends experts say we could see this year. Number one, growing acceptance. Experts expect more people will likely invest in digital assets despite their volatility and extreme swings. We've seen uh, just in the last three months, uh, prices fall over 50%. Uh, and throughout the history of uh, cryptos, um, you know, you can see 80% declines throughout various times. Trend number two, embracing Web3. 
Web3 is described as the next phase of the internet, fueled by blockchain technology. Experts say it's a series of platforms and products where users control their own data instead of big tech. Historically, when we've used the internet, we've always consumed content or given our information to platforms that have then captured all of our value. Let's call it selling our information on Facebook or YouTube. With Web3, these platforms are now being designed such that if you create value for a network, you're able to capture that in the form of a token. And that brings us to trend number three, more regulation. Experts say lawmakers and financial regulators are likely to finally take action on digital currencies. The space was unregulated. It was the wild, wild west. But the sort of reality of that is that the more regulation it is, the harder it is for there to be these crazy investment opportunities that I think we've seen make. All in will be right back with some more signing day. Crypto is popular before. For today's con well, yes, sir. We'll get right on that. I'll see you in the morning, okay? All right, bye. How long I got? I'm going to need you to pull the two coordinates for the DOQQ. t -Loop Communication needs to build a new tower to fill a gap in their cell coverage, and they're going to need a clear line of sight between that tower and their antenna. I'm downloading the DTM for a cross-section view. We're going to have to get that hill ground truth to find out what's there. There's a Phil Coon at the city. I can make the call. Okay, what do you need? We have a mature pine plantation about 60 feet tall. There's a clear line of sight at 175 feet and above. That's how tall they'll need to build. All right, looks good. Print it off. All right, here's the information on the hill we're looking at. It seems perfect for the new tower. We'll start construction immediately. Thanks for getting us so quickly. In the past, we would have no eight weeks. We gotta love modern geomatics. More like geo magic. We need boundary and topographic survey. And we're back. I'm Brandon Thomas here with a segment on National Signing Day. National Signing Day is a day that's special across the country. High school students across the country sign their letter of intent to go play on the next level, whether that's baseball, football, basketball, whatever. Now, let's get into it and analyze who Nichols picked up for National Signing Day. First off, we have Nino Lee May. Mr. Lee May is one of the best of the best. Nino Lee May is a wide receiver from West Feliciana. He's a flyer, and he could be a kick returner. Real fast whenever the ball gets in his hand, and he's a playmaker. Next, we have Elijah Winters. Elijah Winters is a DB out of Ponsatula. Ponsatula was the runner-up just now from the, uh, from the 5A championship. Made a real big difference on the team. He's a ball hawk. He started as a freshman. He had 30 picks. He's real tall, too. He's Well, he, he has good size for, for his position. He's 5'11", 190 pounds, a real hitter. Next, we have Ethan Lee from Thibodeau, Louisiana. Ethan Lee went to Edie White High School. He just signed on to Nickel State. He's real cerebral. He's a difference maker on the field. Some of those games, E.D. White was out of it, but then Ethan Lee brought him back into it with his dynamic playmaking. Next, we have Scrappy. Yes, Scrappy Osby. Scrappy Osby is a 5'11 wide receiver from Ponsatula High School. He has real breakaway speed, and just like, excuse me, just like Nino, he's a good kick returner and punt returner. Nick Williams, big man from University Labs. 
University Lab recently won the 3A championship, and Nino and Nick Williams was a big part of that. He's 6'2", 290 pounds, and is a real physical gap plugger on the defensive line. Caden Jones, linebacker, St. Rose, Louisiana. Caden Jones played at St. Charles Catholic High School, the state championship team, was real cerebral, and it was very physical. He was a playmaker, and he made things happen. Joshua Martin Jr., big man out of Bonneville High School. Joshua Martin is six foot five, and he has great off-the-ball speed. Anthony Brown from Mobile, Alabama, a great pass rusher. He's good at the defensive end position, but he can also play some different spots. Real good from McGill Tony Toddy High School. Eli Ennis, Wachita, excuse me, Otachi, Alabama. He's six foot two, two hundred and five pounds. Plays safety, real, real every man's man. He plays defense, he plays special teams, and he played offense. Traylon Whaley, wide receiver from Glenn, Louisiana, played at Livonia High School, six foot five, one hundred and ninety five pounds. Alex Villaveto, defensive lineman from home of Louisiana, right here at Vanderbilt Catholic. Six foot, 220 pounds. Willie Butler, defensive back, 5'11", 185 pounds from Mobile, Alabama. Jaquan Frank, defensive end from Pensacola, Florida. Went to Pine Forest High School, real strong guy. Six foot two, 220 pounds. Kylan Dupree, a kicker slash a punter. You always need one of those. Special teams is a phase of the game that's very crucial. From Gessmer, Louisiana, went to Catholic High School. Rashad Lovelace, defensive lineman. Six foot three, 285 pounds from Pensacola, Florida, with the Pine Forest High. Samaji Scott. Offensive lineman went to Lutcher, went to Lutcher High School, six foot two, two hundred and seventy-five pounds, real physical guy. Tank McMath, brother of Racy McMath, six foot two, two hundred pounds, went to Edna Carr High School. Braden Johnson, linebacker, six foot one, two hundred and fifty pounds. Ponchatoula, Louisiana, was a part of that team, just like his teammates joined him down here in the Bayou. Connor Ogeron from John Curtis High School, real cerebral guy, coached by J.T. Curtis, one of the most winningest coaches in high school football. Kyla Paul, 5'10", 190 pounds from Patterson High School. Good wide receiver, nice size, real playmaker. Those are just some of the names, those are the names that Coach uh, Tim Rebo has brought in this year to make a real difference on the Colonel's football team. We have some other players returning, and we have some other players that we might get throughout this process. It should be a great year for Colonel football. Frog legs is a popular dish in, in Louisiana, real embedded in Cajun culture. LouisianaTravels.com, well, eat them all. Frog legs is up next. Yes, sir. We'll get right on that. I'll see you in the morning, okay? All right, bye. I'm going to need you to pull the two coordinates for the DOQQ. t -Loop Communication needs to build a new tower to fill a gap in their cell coverage, and they're going to need a clear line of sight between that tower and their antenna. I'm downloading the DTM for a cross-section view. We're going to have to get that hill ground truth to find out what's there. There's a field crew in that vicinity. I can make the call. Okay, what do you need? We have a mature pine plantation about 60 feet tall. There's a clear line of sight at 175 feet and above. That's how tall they'll need to build. All right, looks good. Print it off. All right, here's the information on the hill we're looking at. It seems perfect for your new tower. 
we'll start construction immediately. Thanks for getting us so quickly. In the past, we didn't have to wait weeks. We got to love modern geomatics. More like geo magic. Welcome back to All In. I'm Jay Jozo. Frog legs is a popular Cajun dish best served fried according to louisianatravel.com. We'll eat all the frog legs you want. Scientists have found a way to grow more. Scientists from Tufts and Harvard University have successfully gotten frogs to grow back amputated legs for their experiment. They use aqua frogs the same kind you may have in aquariums at your local pet stores. The researchers made silicon caps which resemble tiny dumps containing drugs to reduce inflammation and help grow blood vessels. They amputated the frog's hind legs and put the caps over the wounds for 24 hours. Over the next 18 months, many of the frogs grew new legs that were fully functioned and almost as good as the originals. The biggest thing that the new legs lacked were bones in the tombs. The results suggest that frogs and maybe other animals have dormant regenerative capabilities that can be triggered into action. The study was published in the journal Science Advances. No mask, no problem. With the current surge of COVID-19 cases, leaders in New Mexico are thinking outside of the box in their effort to keep people safe. Brianna Abuzi took a look at their innovative idea. We're here at the Powake supermarket and just imagine coming in, turning to your right and just having access to dozens of free face masks. Now this idea started with members from the nearby cultural center. Like other areas in New Mexico, the Pueblo has been noticing an uptick in COVID-19 cases. So the community wanted to do its part to really stress those safety protocols against the virus. The machine not only offers free masks to anyone in the general public, but each bag also comes with two masks to encourage double masking. Leaders we spoke with say the local reaction has been incredible. I'm really just happy people are using it. You know, we didn't know what to expect and it has been really successful. So I'm, I'm really, really happy that people are utilizing it. Because of the high demand leaders have seen, they do ask people to take one package per person so that others have a chance to be better. Today in the entertainment news, the soundtrack to a popular movie and series based on the video games, here's David Daniel with the Hollywood Minute. The Encanto soundtrack is still riding high. It tops the Billboard 200 album chart for a third non-consecutive week with its best sales week so far. It's the first soundtrack to spend at least three weeks at number one since A Star is Born a few years ago. The Master Chief was enhanced and trained for one purpose. To win this war, he and the other Spartans are our only effective weapons against the Covenant. He is lethal, upgradable, and most importantly, controllable. Paramount Plus has released the first full trailer and the premiere date for Halo, the live action series. Pablo Schreiber stars as Master Chief in the show based on the iconic video games about a war between humanity and the alien menace, The Covenant. Halo debuts March 24th. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. The world's first all-electric passenger plane is almost ready to hit the skies. The company Innovasive calls for this new aircraft Allison. Its prototype first debuted in 2019. The Israelite company says the electric commuter plane can carry up to nine passengers for one hour and has a max cruise speed of 287 miles an hour. Since December, it has been going through low-speed taxi tests in Seattle. A high-speed taxi test could come in the next few weeks. Innovation CEO says Alice may be just weeks away from his first flight. 
folks everywhere are finding ways to enjoy the snow weathery, but one frozen ice queen is held accountable for the frigid temps. Jeremy Rope has today's take a look at this. With all this snow, there's a lot to show, so away we go without further ado. That's not right. The longest sled dog race in the contiguous United States got underway in Minnesota. More than 60 mushers and their canine teams are competing in three events, including the 300-mile title event and the annual John Bear Grease sled dog race. The grueling trek through freezing temps takes roughly four days with only sporadic checkpoints to rest the dogs. Snow-loving rescue dogs in California were in their element as they put on a safety demonstration for skiers and snowboarders in Truckee. The dogs are trained to find human scents underneath the snow in case of an avalanche, and trainers with the North Star Ski Patrol say the work comes naturally to the dog. A 99-year-old woman in South Dakota took to the slopes for the very first time just before her 100th birthday. Family members were there every step of the way to help Edith Warren cross downhill skiing off her bucket list. She enjoyed it so much, she ended up making three runs down the mountain. This was wonderful. Finally, who's to blame for all this snow? Well, the Pickens Police Department in South Carolina may have cracked the case. Body cam video shows them arresting infamous ice queen Elsa, who waved her right to remain silent. She was later booked and brought in to stand trial, but literally froze the proceedings and breezed out the door. Officials now consider it a cold case. For Take a Look at This, I'm Jeremy Roth. The New York Times has acquired the explosively popular word game, Wardle. Wardle has very quickly become a culture phenom phenomenon. It gives players six chances to give five letter words each day. The Times purchased the game for a price it described as in the low seven figures. The game was released in October 2021 by John Wardle, a Brooklyn-based software engineer. He's working with the Times to ensure that existing players win and streaks are preserved once the game moves to the paper site. The Times says it does not have any set plans for the game's future yet, but it says it will initially remain free to new and existing players. One of the stars to watch this Olympics is Abby Brock. She is set to become the first Native American woman to play hockey for the Team USA. Her road to Beignet was an unconventional one. Growing up, Rock had to play one mostly boys teams and she rarely sank any diversity on the rink. It's made me a, who I am today, playing with the guys and having to be tough and not let things get to you, have to always be proving people wrong because people don't think you're tough enough to play with the boys or good enough to play with the boys until they really see it. She does have a chip. She's always had, even at boys hockey, she had a little edge to her. She stood up for herself and biggest challenge is just trying to find a place for her to change a lot of these rinks. No one had women's locker rooms. She was in closets. When you're younger, especially back in the day, I would look at players and I would think, I want to be in the NHL. But there wasn't the NHL for girls like me, especially at the time. And I was sitting there, I was like, well, what else can I do? And then all of a sudden you see these amazing U.S. hockey players on the Olympic stage doing their thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's my dream. That's the highest you can go in hockey. And that's the team I want to be on. My dad was a hockey coach growing up. My mom wanted me to be in figure skates. I hated them. So I basically forced my way out of the figure skates and into hockey skates because I, I just wanted to be like my dad and like his players. She was generally interested in everything from the equipment to how the guys dress, what sticks they used, and all the little things they would do with pucks on the ice. And so it was great to have her around. For him, it was all about having fun. He was never trying to make me the best hockey player in the world. I think he just knew I loved it and wanted me to be exposed to it and built the ice rink so I could have fun with my friends and I think that's where a lot of my skill and my talent really comes from is just all those years having fun in the backyard. I've definitely had an unconventional journey to get to this team. Growing up as an indigenous person, it wasn't really that rare to see other hockey players playing who 
had indigenous roots and then I got to college and I think that's where it really clicked for me that you're different than the rest of your people. It's a challenge for, I know for a lot of indigenous kids to get off the reserve or off the band and move away and fit in but you know Abby obviously was real lucky that she grew up with a lot of kids like that in her, in her town. I want to help to diversify hockey as a sport because it really is a very white sport and we want to we want to change that. Making the sport more diverse is just trying to make it more accessible first of all but also just gaining more visibility that you can make it. I think looking at this roster as a young kid you didn't see anybody who wasn't a white hockey player for me that goes a long way seeing somebody like you be doing it being at the top of the game and knowing that you can make it that far and that hockey is a sport that includes you if one little girl says i want to play hockey because she's playing hockey um, i think that would mean the world to me just changing one person's trajectory and no letting them know that there is a place for them in hockey and letting hockey do its thing because hockey really is one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. The night I was watching something and I kind of had tears in my eyes just thinking about it a little bit. You know, to have an Olympian daughter, you know, and now she's going to go to the Olympics and try to win a gold medal. And she wrote a letter to herself in grade six that she was going to play at Wisconsin. She was going to play in the Olympic team. And, you know, the only thing she hasn't done yet is get the Mustang, she said in the letter she's getting. So, I mean, she's, she's a focused kid. It's just really special to be able to represent your country on truly the biggest stage there is. This isn't a one-time thing for Abby. I think she wants to play now, and she wants to play in four years. I, like, I think Abby wants to play for a long time. She loves it. I wouldn't want to play hockey unless it was the most fun thing in the world, and it really is for me. That's all for today's All In. I am Jay Joseph. Thank you for tuning in. See you next Wednesday or whenever you watch the stream.